Pivotal moments in sea service history and the Naval Institute's role in tackling those big issues frames a centrally important part of this year's annual meeting. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Naval historian and author Dr. Craig Simons. His award-winning published histories are more than 20 in number. His most recent book is Nimitz at War, Command Leadership from Pearl Harbor to Tokyo Bay. Just weeks ago, he was honored by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library with their Literature Award. It's a prestigious award recognizing the author's entire body of work, enriching the understanding of military history and war. Dr. Simons is an author of Naval Institute articles and books, including the masterful Naval Institute Historical Atlas of the U.S. Navy. From 1971 to 74, he served as a naval officer on active duty and indeed taught naval strategy as an ensign while on the staff and faculty of the Naval War College. In 1976, he joined the history department of the Naval Academy and progressed from assistant professor up to full professor of history, served four years as chairman of the department, and he was recognized with appointment as professor emeritus of the department upon his retirement from the Naval Academy in, in 2005. We're proud to have him as a member. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Craig Simons. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have to say I'm a little bit daunted uh, having listened to these wonderful young and some not so young uh, authors uh, talk about their work. Uh, that really is a reflection of why the Naval Institute not only survives but succeeds. We are here to celebrate the sesquicentennial, that is the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Naval Institute here in Annapolis. The idea, both at the time and still, was to provide an independent forum for those who cared about the U.S. Navy and wanted to advance it, to promote it, and to do so in a venue that was outside official channels. In that respect, though the Institute inhabits a building, actually several buildings, including this magnificent new center, on the Naval Academy campus, it is not a house organ. It is not simply a conduit for the official view of anything. It is instead the one thing that every large organization needs and yet few actually have a knowledgeable and sympathetic outside voice, one that is often supportive, but which can be critical at need, a sounding board and not an echo chamber. It may sometimes be annoying, even embarrassing, to the actual establishment, but it is absolutely essential. And for the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Naval Institute is that voice. The megaphone is much bigger now than it was 150 years ago and includes not only the indispensable journal proceeding, but also, as we have seen and heard, books, talks, podcasts, a robust and growing social media presence, daily news highlights, and conferences like this one. The first president of the Institute was John L. Warden, who was at the time superintendent of the Naval Academy and famously the commander of the USS Monitor in the Battle of Hampton Roads during the Civil War. In the 1870s, he and the other plank holders of the Institute were concerned about the drawdown of naval forces after the Civil War and what implications that might have for the future of their service to the country. Those plank holders got a frightening glimpse into the perils of not paying attention almost at once 
in 1873 when a Spanish warship stopped, searched, and interned the steamship Virginius. Built initially as a Civil War blockader, blockade runner rather, she had been purchased after the war by a group of Americans who were sympathetic to the Cuban rebels who were then fighting a war of independence against Spain. The objective of the men who bought the Virginius was to use her to smuggle men, arms, and munitions to the rebels. As her captain, they hired Joseph Fry, who was, incidentally, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and who had served during the Civil War as a Confederate naval officer. On October 30th, 1873, exactly 21 days after the founding of the Naval Institute, a Spanish warship intercepted the Virginius at sea, took her into Santiago Harbor on Cuba's south coast. There, Fry and his entire crew were quickly tried, condemned as pirates, and sentenced to be shot by firing squad. 53 of them, including Fry, were indeed shot and killed. American newspapers clamored for war, and President Grant sent Spain an ultimatum, and to underscore that ultimatum, he ordered the Navy to mobilize. Well, that was easier said than done. The mothballed Civil War monitors ordered to assemble at Key West had old, rusty engines, and in any case, with their low freeboard, marginal buoyancy, the monitors had never been designed for service in the open ocean anyway. And as a result, the mobilization of the American fleet at Key West proved more of an embarrassment than a threat. Now, in the end, the crisis of this so-called Virginius affair was resolved without anyone going to war. Spain apologized paid an indemnity to the families of the slain, and the public temperament quickly cooled to re be replaced by other issues, including the opening of the West and the enforcement of the recently enacted Ku Klux Klan Act. To those who were paying attention, though, those like Warden and the others who founded the Naval Institute, this was a cautionary note evidence that the traditional American reaction to almost any crisis, going into it underprepared, furiously mobilizing, fighting the war, and then demobilizing just as fast, that this might not be a template suitable for the coming century. That, of course, had been the American way of war up to 1873. The size and capability of the U.S. Navy had fluctuated wildly since its birth in the late 18th century, adding ships and manpower for the Quasi-War, the War of 1812, obviously the Civil War, then swiftly casting them aside with the return of peace. In 1861, for example, the United States Navy had a total of 42 active warships. Five years later, it had 671. Five years after that, it was back to 52. This fluctuation, this sine wave, if you would, of naval power is what Warden and the other founding members of the Institute worried about. And from that moment to this, the pages of the proceedings served not only as a sounding board to consider the wisdom of peacetime naval policy, but also where the newest aspects of changing technology were considered, proposed, modified, adjusted. Sometimes that led to the adoption of a new platform. Sometimes it exposed the fallacy of an idea, which is just as important. In particular, the proceedings has been a place for junior officers to raise questions and issues that otherwise might not have made its way up the official chain of command to receive serious attention. We heard from some of those young officers today. 
And look at who some of the others have been. Lieutenant Bradley Fisk. Lieutenant, as we have heard, Ernest King. Lieutenant Chester Nimitz, Dudley Knox, William S. Pye, Hyman Rickover. The format of the proceedings has changed over the years. I've got a, uh, a show and tell here, I think. You've seen this one earlier today already. Here's the cover of the 1874 edition, actually published in 1875. Here is a cover from 1912. I know you can't read it from where you're sitting, but the lead article is about the practical use of submarines by a young lieutenant named Chester Nimitz. Here is one from the year I joined the U.S. Navy in 1971, and here, of course, is the most recent issue. In many ways, the Institute and the proceedings in particular are a mirror one that reflects the issues of all kinds that dominate naval planning, policy, and performance. But it is a two-way mirror. While it reflects contemporary issues, it also projects future possibilities, proposing, predicting, even propelling future platforms, policies, procedures. All of these issues, by the way, remain available today in bound copies. Now, I know a lot of people here access articles online, but I am old school. I like thumbing the bound volumes. I have often gone into the Nimitz Library here at the Academy, sat down to read a particular article from an old issue of the proceedings, and then as one article led to another, I get pulled down into the rabbit hole to a whole smorgasbord of ideas that show me what was being considered and thought and proposed at any given moment in the long history of the United States Navy. I'm currently working on the 1930s, and in the proceedings I can read what Navy officers were thinking about in the 1930s. What naval warfare in the Pacific might look like should one come about. How to conduct amphibious landings on defended beaches. The future, if any, of naval aviation. And the broader implications of war itself. Here are officers, often young officers, struggling with questions about the validity or the humanity of submarine warfare, aerial bombing of civilian targets, as well as more practical issues about targeting and dive angles. Sometimes I read about programs and platforms that ended up as dead ends. But they too show us the fluid character of naval thought. Here are the back and forth arguments about the relative merits of lighter than air dirigibles versus fixed wing aircraft. I mean, after all, dirigibles can stay aloft for days, not fixed wing aircraft. Are you sure that's the way you want to go? Much later, arguments about the relative merits of guns versus missiles for air defense. Absent these discussions, how much longer would it have taken the United States to perceive and more importantly, respond to new realities. No doubt Navy officers would have thought about some of these things, maybe all of these things, even if the proceedings had never existed. But absent a platform to express those views and an audience to consider them and then to argue back in future articles, would they have had the kind of impact needed to affect change? We all remember the old riddle about a tree falling in the forest. Does it make a sound if no one is there to hear it? In the same way, does an idea in the mind of one man, one woman, make an impact absent a venue to share it? The proceedings reported not only on events and ideas in the U.S. Navy, it kept naval officers abreast of events elsewhere in other countries, in other navies, at a time when most Americans pay little or no attention to events overseas. 
There are articles on the tactics and strategy of the Russo-Japanese War, as well as, indeed, sometimes interminably, considerations of the Battle of Jutland. There are lots of reflections on naval history in the proceedings, but of course, as we know, since 1987, most of the historical pieces that might otherwise have appeared in the proceedings now appear in the Institute's other journal, Naval History, the leading periodical of its type, and my personal favorite. I've spent a lot of time talking about the Institute's periodicals, which for more than 100 years have been the centerpiece of the organization, but let me just mention at least a few other roles the Institute has played. Now, you've seen this image already. I, uh, it was, stole my thunder a little bit. The check, written in 1926, with which the Institute provided the seed money to the Naval Historical Foundation. Todd Creekman sent me a copy of this in the hope that I would mention it. Here it is, Todd. I want you to note that it is for a thousand dollars real money in 1926. As an example of how much things have changed, though, here is a copy of the Blue Jackets Manual from 1917, another product of the Institute. I found this image on eBay. It's for sale for, can you guess, $1,000. In addition, of course, there is, as we have seen this afternoon, the Institute's book publishing arm, the Naval Institute Press, founded in 1898, only 25 years after the organization itself. The press has published literally hundreds of books, none more important than the Blue Jackets Manual, first published, as Pete mentioned, in 1902, a copy of which was handed to me in boot camp in 1970, and a copy of which uh, is still being published today. I have to put up the one with Tom Cutler's name on it. He made me do this. <laughs> the Naval Institute Press publishes many other professional books, many of which are also manuals of a sort, including the Petty Officer's Drill Book, the Manual of Wireless Telegraphy, and the Division Officer's Guide. Others have explored more philosophical topics, such as How Navies Fight by Frank Ulig or Wayne Hughes' book on fleet tactics. The press has rescued a number of classics from out-of-date dustbins, including Julian Corbett's Principles of Maritime Strategy, J.C. Wiley's Military Strategy, and Samuel Elliott Morrison's History of Naval Operations in World War II. And also, history books. I am a naval historian, and I am delighted, though no longer surprised, whenever I go into Nimitz Library looking for detailed information about a particular topic of naval history, I find that at least 85% of the books that I need to guide me are Naval Institute Press books. And while I'm speaking of books, this year the Naval Institute will release Dennis Cliff's new book. Here is the cover of that one, aptly entitled The Pen and the Sword, which goes into far more detail about the Naval Institute than I can here. So let me end by simply repeating what Captain Roy Smith said 100 years ago in 1923. With the possible, possible, exception of the Naval War College at Newport, no other source has so greatly furthered the material development and professional advancement of the Navy than the Naval Institute. Congratulations to all of us.